inspection, opening your eyes, could be very interesting also. Yeah. In fact, inspection, when you, when you start examining the patient, inspection is the first thing you do before you go to functional examination and perhaps, perhaps palpation. Yeah. <clears throat> when we do a functional examination, we try to work with as less test as possible. A relevant test. I'm looking for information that really helps me. Is something wrong with the bones? Is something wrong with the joints? Is something wrong with the dura? Is something wrong with the nerve roots? But okay, that's for later. Inspection. It already starts in the waiting room. Your patient is waiting. <coughs> How is he sitting there? You say goodbye to your previous patient and already with one eye you look at the next one. How is he sitting there? How does he stand up? Remember the story of curve reversal? They are sitting in a slouched position and they have problems going to a lordotic position. Yeah. Typical for internal derangement. How does he walk in? I say, please have a seat. Some patients, they sit and immediately, boom, kyphotic position again. And they don't complain too much. When this patient tells me a big story, I can't do this anymore, I can't do that, then I have some doubts about that. If you invite a patient in your clinic, say, please have a seat. And the patient says, well, if you don't mind, <laughs> I don't want to sit anymore. Yeah. If he tells a bigger story, <coughs> this is more, more credible. <laughs> Another little detail. Um, how does he undress and how does he dress? I would like, after the history, yeah, he has to undress to do the functional examination. I would like to see that. In my clinic, <coughs> I don't have any, any curtain where the patient is behind, where he undresses and... No, 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 no. I have to see that in a, in a discreet way. If the patient just told me he had some problems with, with flexion and so on, I have to see that when he's undressing. And another super important reason is after the treatment. You talk about prophylactic information. Yeah. You just explain some important things and you just explain him that at this moment I don't want too much flexion. He understands it. And what's the first thing he does when he puts on his clothes? Flexion. So if he's behind the curtain, you don't see that. You can't react. I prefer to react. Yeah. <clears throat> so inspection perhaps goes a little bit further than you, than you think. Um, <clears throat> in fact, in the examination, we start with one palpation. And what exactly are we doing? We are palpating along the spinous processes. And I'm looking, I'm looking for two things. I'm looking for, <clears throat> on the one hand, an angular kyphosis. And what is an angular kyphosis? Is a very, is a very local, <coughs> prominent kyphosis. Let's imagine the patient is older and has quite some degeneration. Well, then this is rather irrelevant. Let's imagine the patient has quite a lot of pain, central back pain, there was a trauma, there is not much radiation of pain, and you find an angular kyphosis. Ah, be careful, be careful. Ask for medical imaging, could be a fracture. And if you, <clears throat> if you feel a shelf, and what is a shelf? Well, you're palpating and at a certain moment your finger is stuck and you have to move a little bit more posterior before you can continue because this vertebra is in anterior translation. In other words, spondylolisthesis. Yeah. 
when you feel a shelf he has spondylolisthesis. What does that mean? Perhaps nothing. Remember in one of the other films spondylolisthesis has a typical story pain on walking and standing which disappears on sitting and lying. So keep that in mind. Is there any difference in leg length? Among physios worldwide that seems to be a core issue, so to speak, but how, how can you examine that in an objective way without, without medical imaging? Well, you stand behind the patient and you check, you check the level of both Christi, you check the level of spina iliaca posterior superior, you check the caudal aspect of the gluteal muscles, and then you stand in front of the patient and you check the level of spina iliaca anterior superior and then the patient is lying and you measure, you measure the distance from spina iliaca anterior superior until the medial malleolus. And if all elements point in the same direction, then yes, there is a leg difference. So what? In many cases, this is completely asymptomatic. What you could do, if there is, let's say, a significant leg length difference, you could repeat your tests in standing by neutralizing this leg length difference by, let's say, a patient stands with, uh, with one foot on, on two books or whatever. You neutralize that and you repeat your tests. And if the patient then says, well, that feels better, then you have a positive link. And then, of course, the solution is going to be quite easy. But unfortunately, in many cases, leg length difference doesn't play such a big role. Hey, keep in mind, we are so much focused on symmetry. But the rule is that we are not symmetrical. So let's, let's, not, let's not forget that. Much more important, much more interesting for me, does the patient have a deviation, a flexion deviation or a lateral deviation? Talking about a lateral deviation, I'm not talking about a scoliosis. A scoliosis doesn't interest me that much, unless, of course, you talk about the Formula One scoliosis, that's another world. Yeah. But a minor scoliosis is mostly completely asymptomatic. I'm talking about a nice flexion deviation or a nice lateral deviation without rotational component. Yeah? <coughs> wow! This is a phenomenal scoliosis patient. And you know what the strange part was? This patient at that time was asymptomatic. And this is already a super scoliosis. We don't have to be naive, of course. Yeah? Sooner or later, when bone hits bone, when bone hits bone, it's going to be quite problematic. But this is, this is an extreme case. So I'm interested in those patients with a very beautiful flexion deviation or a very nice lateral shift deviation. So when you see a patient, well, look at that, a very beautiful lateral deviation. When you see this, you are practically sure that the patient has an internal derangement. And you're practically sure that it is a bigger internal derangement. So this is really very valuable information. This is an x-ray of a patient who had a wonderful lateral deviation. Yeah. And there's a strange story attached to that patient. Um, that patient was a German patient, if I'm not mistaken, um, visited yeah, her doctor. But unfortunately, this doctor was not very aware of principles of orthopedic medicine in general. And what was his solution? To do surgery and to do a fixation of the spine on multiple levels. 
unfortunately, that patient consulted another doctor who, by coincidence, did a Syriacs and a McKenzie training program and understands more about uh, soft tissue lesions. And he immediately recognized, okay, that's a big internal derangement. You need a good physio. And two weeks later, that patient was okay. Yeah? You can play with this deviation. A patient can have pain over here and deviate away from the pain or have pain over there and deviate towards the pain. What does that mean? Yeah. This is just related to the size and the position of the internal derangement. Yeah. We're, going to, we're going to use that in the future in our treatment strategy. The direction of the deviation is going to be useful information to implement when we do certain manipulation maneuvers. But once again, a lumbar lateral shift typical for internal derangement, okay? You can also have an alternating deviation. The patient has, let's say, a right deviation, and he does a flexion, and at the end of the flexion, he's in the left deviation. Fantastic. Or he has a deviation in standing which disappears in flexion. Or he has no deviation in standing which appears in flexion. One little detail. Huh? When you do the functional examination with the patient and the patient is doing a flexion movement and you stand lateral to the patient, you don't see that. Always stand behind your patient. Then you see those deviations. Otherwise you don't. But why? Why can that change? This is just a discodural pressure gain. During flexion, intradiscal pressure is changing. The mobility of the dura is also an important role. And it's perfectly possible that the dura flips over an internal derangement what is a deviation? A deviation is an antalgic posture. He feels better like this. He doesn't know why he's in this position, but he feels oh, I'm more comfortable. Yeah. This is going to be less, less, let's say, unfavorable pressure. But my favorite deviation, my absolute favorite one, is the painful arc deviation. That's a patient who is standing, has no deviation. And he does a flexion. Now what do you see? Somewhere in the middle of the flexion. And he continues. Somewhere in the middle of the flexion, he goes off track. And he comes back onto the track. A momentary deviation. Fantastic. How do you interpret that? In those three cases, the deviation is always there. This is the bigger protrusion. In those cases, deviation is sometimes there. It's still a big protrusion, but a smaller one. And this is the best one. This is, this is the small version. Huh? Deviation means it's big. And this is the smallest of the big ones. Very useful information. So, have fun.